The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar, The Invisible Patient, the first of our Perigen Strip Review Series. On the line live today, my name is Lexi. I'm the Marketing Manager here at Perigen. I have Karen Kalega, who is a Clinical Engagement Executive, and Dr. Alana McGalrick, who's our Chief Nursing Officer here at Perigen. So this presentation includes information from sources that are designated on the slides. The following studies were not conducted by Perigen. To ask a question during the webinar, please enter your question into the chat box located in the GoToWebinar panel on the right side of your screen. Um, during the case review, we encourage you to type into the chat box. So a little bit about the host, Perigen. So Perigen is passionate about providing innovative software solutions that protect moms and babies. Um, Perigen is a creator of PeriWatch Vigilance, the only automated early warning system for both mom and baby. And it can overlay your existing EFM to quickly and consistently identify patients who may be developing a potentially worsening condition. So our presenter today is Dr. Alana McGalrick, Chief Nursing Officer here at Perigen. With significant perinatal experience, Dr. McGalrick leads Perigen's efforts to expand and enhance clinical education, customer outcomes reporting, and publishing. And now I will hand it over to Dr. Alana McGarrick. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I think for bandwidth sake, we will be going off of our cameras for now, but know that we're still here. So it's not a, a phantom voice talking to you, um, but I am concerned about technology uh, making it through our presentation today. So I will be turning my camera off. So the objectives for today's discussion are listed here uh, for you. You can always go back uh, when evaluating the program to see if we did meet those objectives for you. Um, but I'm sure uh, most of the audience, if not everyone knows that uh, first you write the curriculum and then you go back and write your objectives. So um, my intent is of course to meet those. Today's agenda, um, I want to initially talk about the invisible patient and, um, you know, the, the specialty of labor and delivery nursing. Um, we're going to touch upon the oxygen transport system and really discuss a little, uh, some components about the chain supply from mom to baby. We're going to talk about some cord blood gases. I have a couple of poll questions to just do a, a really nice overview of, of why those are so important. And then uh, talk about some uh, maternal and fetal uh, circulation and how it affects our fetal heart rate assessment. And then, of course, we're going to get into the case reviews. I think that's the, the best part about um, looking at strips anyway. So I'm not sure who's attending today. I tend not to look at the participant names that have registered. Um, uh, I don't do so until afterwards, um, mostly because it probably makes me a bit nervous because I can't see you. Um, I'm used to being in front of a crowd uh, live for fetal monitoring or any presentation. So this virtual presentation or distance education uh, stuff has, has been really been new to me and I feel like I'm talking to myself most of the time. So I really wish I could see everybody and, and maybe technology will get better so that we can have a more interactive um, conversation during these um, these large webinars. So um, a little bit about me. Um, I started in med surg uh, when I came out of uh, university. They stuck all the new grads in med surg. Um, at the time, I was not uh, um, happy 
I wanted to be in labor and delivery only. Um, but uh, as I look back, I was very appreciative of my first year in med surge. Um, but uh, to be a labor nurse to me was um, the most important part about my nursing career. And I couldn't wait to be able to read those strips that uh, my my mentors and my preceptors would lay out in the hallway uh, and look at them sideways uh, to see what was going on with the fetal strip. And I thought, oh gosh, I just want to be like them. I don't know what they're looking at. You know, I was always fascinated by what that fetal heart was trying to tell us on that little piece of paper, um, like basically a, a little squiggle. But for those that, um, that do know me, uh, they'll know that this is my personal passion and I'm really a big geek when it comes to fetal monitoring. And Lexi, who you just met, um, was very, very gracious enough to design the license plate that I always wanted. So anyone that has been in labor and delivery for some time, I'm hoping that you got my little play on words here. Uh, it does say beat to beat. And um, when we started, we had to document long-term variability and short-term variability. And you were looking for that R to R <laughs> interval to make sure that your baby um, was still tolerating uh, the intrapartum stages. And uh, you know, if it had beat to beat variability and you were documenting short-term variability, your baby was still fine um, after you put in a, an internal. Um, so I always wanted this license plate and it was probably too obscure for the rest of the world to understand, but I thought there would be that little small pocket of the population that understood what beat to beat what meant. So I guess that being said, um, now you know a little bit about me and why, um, why I wanted this license plate. You'll forgive me a bit as I jump onto my soapbox here and we start talking about fetal monitoring. Um, this, uh, this passion for me runs quite deep and I only have um, 40 minutes to talk about it, which is clearly not enough time, but I will try to keep it as short as possible. So, I've had the privilege of presenting to many um, hospital A teams, uh, quality councils, healthcare organizations, C-suites, and discussing what the invisible patient is. Um, I found it quite frustrating when I first started in administration in the perinatal space that uh, no one understood what I was talking about when I tried to uh, explain why we needed minimum staffing, even if there were no patients on the unit, um, justifying overtime, um, explaining why you know we needed an on-call schedule like the ER and we needed to operate um, in a certain way that was a that was different than the rest of the uh, the hospital was run so for those that um, are attending this call you all understand because I am preaching to the choir uh, we know that we're caring for an invisible patient that we don't get credit for in staffing um, it still looks like I'm a one to two or one to one or one to three although um, we have a a small being that is completely dependent upon us making critical decisions at the bedside to ensure that they have a, a safe arrival. Um, and I mentioned this before, but it's just a squiggly line on a monitor that uh, we base those life-saving decisions upon. So to me, you can't get more elite than the labor and delivery unit. So when I talk to the A-teams in the C-suite, I try to explain how we are a combination of an ER, an OR, an ICU and an acute care unit. Um, for us, we're always waiting for that proverbial bus to pull up to our doors. Um, to others, it may look like some sort of coordinated chaos, um, but we understand our service line. And um, it looks like we are always operating in some sort of silo, but um, unfortunately, it, it's just because they don't know what they don't know. We can't explain it, but I like to describe how um, our in invisible patient is dependent upon that environment that that patient brought to us. So the maternal patient brings the environment that now we need to deal with. We had no control of what was coming through that door. Um, you know, explaining how complicated that situation can be um, is difficult because each patient is an individual. So when you say, oh, well, I might expect, you know, this well patient, you know, labor and delivery um, and, and the pregnant patient is supposed to be a wellness approach to care. Um, unfortunately, we need to expect that they're coming in um, with some sort of illness uh, in order to prepare for the unknown. So I know I'm biased. Um, I don't apologize for valuing our skill set and knowledge base, and I will always brag about our specialty. 
um, I am so proud to be amongst the best um, and certainly the best in the business here at Perigen. So I hope you can forgive me as we as we move through and I and I preach to you about just how great you are. So let's talk about fetal monitoring. Um, it's been in place for close to 50 years. And, you know, um, it actually started um, with experiments uh, and not on humans. So when the experiments were occurring, they were occurring on um, on fetal uh, the lambs. So everyone knows that it it certainly did not have the rigor that we would have expected. And of course, it couldn't, right? It had to stay in the experimental phase because we can't experiment on, um, on a fetus. So, oops, yeah, I'm still on background. It's moving around. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, so it's still considered to be in that experimental phase, even though we've had it in place that it is common practice in, in the literature is saying that 80% of our labor patients have this applied to them as soon as they walk through the door. Um, we make assumptions that the tracing is based on a, a reflection of how the, the fetus is tolerating that intrauterine environment um, and those events that are, are uh, marking the fetal strip are or what is actually happening. And the fetus is telling us whether they can, you know, it's a stop or go um, event for them. The expectation um, with fetal monitoring was that it was going to promote early intervention and that we could go in and we could prevent uh, fetal and neonatal injury. And um, actually the underlying thesis from this was that we were going to reduce uh, the incidence of cerebral palsy that occurred during the interpartum phase. And anyone who's taken A1's course or has read ACOG and AAP's uh, joint publication knows that that actually didn't happen. Um, and, and so here we are, we're still applying the fetal monitor when the patient comes through the door and um, sitting within that, um, that experimental phase of, of this science. Next slide. So what is the significance? Well, all, we all know that there's an increasing national maternal M&M rate. And with a spotlight on this uh, increasing national M&M rate uh, nationally, we need to decide what the best uh, approach is for care for our patients. Um, I've already alluded to this. Uh, gone is the wellness approach. Our patients do not come in healthy, quote unquote, anymore. Our patients are coming in with comorbidities associated with their pregnancy, whether they're waiting and delaying pregnancy to a later age, or they're already, um, you know, suffering from some sort of chronic disease. So that could have been diabetes, hypertension, um, obesity. And these things all complicate um, the, the normal pregnancy um, stages. And so if we consider that as the illness that they're presenting with, we all know that the maternal environment is not ideal to setting up our fetus to having an oxygen and, and nutrient rich um, blood supply. So I, you know, you already start thinking, okay, so what does my patient look like? What is that baby baby's environment look like um, that he's been growing in for the last nine months? Unfortunately, we've had a lack of perinatal patient safety standardization. We have a number of um, associations and collaboratives um, within the uh, within the United States that have pushed forward, um, like the AIM bundle, CMQCC. Everyone is trying to set the standard of what we think the practice should look like, but unfortunately, there is no um, mandate that we follow that. So each hospital, and each healthcare organization can take those those uh, recommendations and, and really um, they end up tweaking and, and making their own. So we lose that, that, um, that uh, attempt at, at standardizing. Now accepted terminology, most people are using the NICHD from 2008, which was reaffirmed, um, but not all. Some have chosen to use the five-tier classification through pair. Um, you'll see that more in the Northwest here in the United States, and, and others have chosen um, not to use it at all. You'll see hospitals that um, you know don't, uh, don't use the same terminology. Category ones are not called category ones. They just use a descriptor of this strip. So, um, so it may differ from, from region to region or from hospital to hospital. So until we have um, consensus and we all agree on which definitions we're going to use moving forward, we're still going to have that, that um, 
error in, in communication because I can say one thing to a physician and he has to memorize how I spoke, but, but my colleague may, may describe the same strip another way. And that delivering clinician now has to memorize the way my colleague um, presents and knows the difference, you know, or that they're the same between the two primary RNs that are caring for the patient. So, so we sit in this sort of um, this sort of turmoil until we we feel like we can move forward and have everybody agree. I don't know if that's going to happen, but um, I'm instructor trainer for A1, so of course I advocate for the NICHD terminology. So what's the problem? I think Clark in his 2017 um, publication uh, captures this quite well. It's a valuable but imperfect tools. So fetal monitoring has certainly um, provided us with a lot of information and given us a uh, justification for a lot of life-saving decisions that we and the delivering clinicians do make. But those things that it theorized that it was going to do, decrease the number of babies born with CP, um, supposed to decrease the number of babies that were stillborn. Um, unfortunately, it didn't do that. It increased our C-section rates. We still have questions about the efficacy, the inter-rater reliability, and then the challenges with subjective strip assessment and our lack of standardized interventions based on what we're seeing um, on the strip. So how do you care for a patient you can't see? And um, so I'm surprising um, everyone here, but we are going to use the chat box. Um, so if you can, um, this is an opportunity for us to take a rather large uh, webinar and, and make it as interactive as possible. So if you could go to your chat box, um, maybe you could share an idea or two on how you uh, justify care for the patient you can't see. Something you might have said to your A-team, something you might have said to um, the boss that you report to, um, making them understand how, how elite this specialty is. And I'll give you a few minutes there and then, or a few seconds based on our time. Okay, I am not seeing anything, but that may be the view that I have. So um, KK or Lexi, if you're seeing anything come into the chat, please let me know. Okay, so maybe you haven't had to have those conversations with your A-team or um, with anyone else who questions that invisible patient. Um, hey, Alana, it's KK. I'm seeing yeah. some come in under questions, not under okay. chat. So um, uh, Ms. Hudson says, we are critical care and we have had to really fight to be able to keep two nurses. Karen Sigley, love her name, Karen. Fetal monitoring helps us see the baby's oxygenation. Um, Susan Smith says, you know, using our hands and touching the, and I like to think of the tracing, oh, I lost that. I like to think of the tracing as if the fetus is talking to me. That's from Dead Bear. Oh, nice. Great stuff. Yeah, so those are great. I think that, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how we share what's in the questions. Maybe we can, I'm, I'm saying this to Lexi and KK, if we can copy and paste them somewhere, because I think these are really good ideas on how we move forward, especially when we're talking to preceptors and the new grads. You know, you know part of what we do is, is um, teaching them about the invisible patient. It's not just because there's a monitor attached to mom's abdomen. Next slide. So moving from the invisible patient, let's just talk a little bit, and I hope we can have a, a, an honest and frank discussion about current fetal monitoring practices. Um, I'm a little bit older probably than, than some, and when I started in labor and delivery, uh, we weren't allowed to sit at the nurse's station. Um, if we did sit at the nurse's station, um, we were asked why we were sitting there. And um, so you scattered when you saw your charge nurse coming or a manager or a director. Um, and we had satellite stations. So, you know, we tended to, to hover close to our, our patients' rooms anyway, because back in the day, we didn't have central monitoring. Um, our doors were wide open. Uh, volume was turned up um, quite loud on our monitors so that we could hear our patients. 
um, and uh, we could, you know, be seen frequently if you'd walk down the hall, say you were going to get some ice chips, and you heard a D cell and it wasn't your room, well, the door was open, you popped in, do you need any help? Um, we were in tune with what those fetal heart rate sounds um, were. And I think that for me, and I think um, someone said that in the questions was using our senses, right? It's not just reading the fetal strip or the monitor, you know, the computer monitor and making sure I clicked on the right thing. It was, I was using my hearing, I was using sight, I was using touch, I was talking to my patient um, and asking them, is the baby moving? Do you, you know, how do you feel? And really getting in um, to using the, the senses uh, to assess our patient. And, and um, you know, like I said, I'm old school, so maybe um, this is uh, not going to resonate with some, but I feel like some of that is a lost art. We've lost the ability to listen um, and, and use our other senses when, when assessing the fetal strip. I've also seen laboring from the desk. And if I have any former colleagues from my uh, previous place of employment, you'll know that I hated it when I saw everybody sitting at the desk, but that's how I was raised in labor and delivery. So um, we didn't get to hang at the desks uh, unless you were rolling belts. So maybe that makes a couple people chuckle, but yes, we used to wash our belts and then we had to roll them all and go stock all our um, nurse servers with belts for the monitors. Um, so if you're rolling belts, you got to sit at the station, but. Um, with the door set, shut and shut central monitoring now, um, you know, I find that the practice has moved away from the bedside and now we're just staring at giant screens and trying to assess what's going on with our patient and I call it laboring from the desk. Um, along with that becomes lack of frequent peer consults. Um, we, we asked each other, hey, what's this? Come see this. Ripped off the strip, ran in the hallway, threw it on the floor and said, look, what am I looking at? What is going on with this patient? And I find now that it's on the monitor that, you know, of course, we're not ripping off strips. Some people don't even um, have them anymore, um, but we're, we're losing that peer, that peer consult. And um, I wish I could have my, peer, my preceptors come on from way back then. I'm sure they would make you guys laugh a little bit on the things that I used to do, but, um, but I really relied on, on them and, and learned so much from having the consults that would happen on those patients. Um, Task-oriented nursing. Nursing has moved into a, uh, I mean, we go through cycles on how to care for our patients, but now it's, you know, step one through 10. You have to document here. Did you document on this thing? Did you document on that thing? Did you click here? Did you do this? I find that we've been forced into checking boxes um, and that seems to, to dominate our, our care practice versus, you know, just making sure that the patient has what they need in their provided with that adequate care. Um, the time at the bedside is getting smaller and smaller. And I know, again, preaching to you guys, but you know that um, you know our time is spent now documenting and, and not being able to labor. Staffing ratios impact um, how that uh, works too. If you're a one to two or one to three with a labor patient, I mean, you can only spend so much time per patient because you have to um, run off to the next one. And the normalization of deviance, I spoke about this in my last presentation. So if this terminology is new um, to you, this is, you know, this is referring to the, I've seen this um, before, my baby turned out fine. Um, so I'm just gonna watch and wait. And we kind of hang out in this space and, and then hours go by and, you know, babies don't, don't always turn out fine. Um, and that's why I love strip review because those hours start to add up because when you're on the unit and you're busy and you're working between two patients, um, you don't realize how much time has passed and, um, and you know, the baby continues to, to function or not function in that oxygen deprived space. So um, I think that's a really big, big issue with our category twos. So we're gonna see some category twos as we move through today. Okay. So here's a fun poll question. Um, Lexi's going to launch. <laughs> Why are you interested in fetal monitoring? Of course, there's only a couple right answers here. So. It should be launched up on your screen. Ooh, other. So I'm interested in the other because I did that kind of as a joke to see what everybody would do. If you want to chat that or put in the question, I don't know where they're all, where everyone's talking. Because I can't see. 
Okay. You should be able to put it in the questions box. Okay. Okay, we can go on for sake of time because I'm already at 24 minutes. Okay, so we're going to start to look at the fetal monitoring part, right? So um, I like to consider this the supply chain for those that have done the A1 courses. You know, this is the extrinsic uh, influences on the on fetal circulation. But so, um, but for me, and you're going to see this as I move through. I'm like a huge flowchart person, so I break things down so that I can remember them in an easier fashion. Um, and this is how I like to look at the uh, maternal environment and how it affects the newborn's oxygen uh, transport system. So we go from mom, remember mom, she's she's whatever she's bringing to you, right? And uh, I should tell you now, I never trust what mom says. I only trust what I um, what I hear when I'm doing my, my assessment and um, my history. And then um, I look at what's going on with baby, right? Um, so whatever mom's environment is, and then uh, we look at what the uterus, what what, what she's bringing uh, with her uterine environment. Um, when we evaluate the fetus via, via the fetal heart strip, we're specifically evaluating its ability to adapt, right, to any or interruptions in this supply chain. So after that uterine environment, I'm looking at what kind of placenta has come my way. And um, I'm sorry if there is someone I used to. Um, you know, if I was your preceptor, you know, I made you put your hands in the placenta. I wanted you to feel it. Look at the, the fetal shiny side. Look at the maternal side, like how, where the working part, that's the working part of the, the placenta, like all the, 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 the components of it. So they, they had a really good appreciation of it. Again, using all their senses and they can go, oh, so my, my patient has preeclampsia and they could break it right back down to mom, uterus, placenta. So any interruptions in this pathway, you know, the fetus is going to suffer some sort of consequence, consequences, but it just varies by degree and the duration of, of what that interruption um, may have been. Oh, this is my favorite slide. Um, so like I said, I used to make my uh, new grads and those that I was precepting put their hands in um, the placenta and I like them to do some visualization. So um, that placenta is a very important part of the supply chain. And of course, um, I love my patients to have the pot roast, right? That's what I want coming in the door. I want that super healthy, um, you know, 39, 40 week placenta that's done its job. It's got some calcifications in it from maturation, but nothing, um, no infarcts because it's super healthy. Um, but what I do is I prepare for the raisin. I prepare for the crappy looking placenta that didn't get enough nutrients, you know, based on whatever happened with mom's environment. And I am going to prepare for that compromised fetus. Um, love it if I got a pot roast, love the pot roast but I'm preparing for the raisin um, because, uh, you know, in the end it's about, um, you know, not being surprised by anything and I, and I don't like surprises from, from my patients. Okay, so everyone's probably seen this slide and went, ah, oh, there's just so much on it. So uh, when we make the uh, assumption that we have a pot roast when discussing the placenta, we assume it's well-nourished, right? So this is what it should look like. This is a well-nourished like graphic, uh, a slide um, uh, section of, of the placenta. Um, and it's without any abnormalities. So you don't see any infarcts. You don't see any like uh, wimpy looking arteries or veins. Um, but um, what it does do is this, this uh, picture gives you an idea of where the intervillous space is, right? Where that exchange is going to occur for the oxygen rich blood and the um, nutrients and then where the exchange of the waste is occurring too. Um, and I don't expect you to memorize this, but I do want you to feel like you can get comfortable with it. Um, but most important, remember I told you about the working side of the placenta is because it contains those cotyledons. And there's 15 to 20 of them, usually. Um, lobules is what they call them. So they've got these cotyledons that have the spiral artery within it. And that um, are those main branches of the single large main stem villus from the fetal side. So this is these are the shower heads that are pushing out all the, 
the blood, um, and this is what needs to clot off so our patients don't, um, don't hemorrhage after delivery. So maybe all that's starting to make some connections. So we did break this down in another slide, so you're going to get to see that. So we've talked a little bit about um, the maternal uh, uh, chain, supply chain. What maternal, what maternal conditions might impact fetal oxygen and blood delivery? Give everyone a few seconds to answer that. Looks like we have about half in right now. Hey, it's KK. While everyone's answering, I just wanted to let you know there's a few people who are saying they have difficulty with audio. If you open the audio section, there's a call in number that you could use and try that way to get to the audio. Thanks, KK. Correct. While hypertension, diabetes, and prolonged pregnancy, they all impact, you know, the, the quality of that placenta. Um, and there are many others. So certainly all of the above. But remember, you know, your patient, they're either coming with a pot roast or a raisin. And most these days are probably walking in with more of a raisin than a pot roast. In my head. So here we broke down that that um, the scary slide of the the section of the placenta and broke it down to just one lobule, which is the one cotyledon. Um, and I do have to give graphic credits to Lexi. She did create this, and Lexi is not a labor nurse, and I thought she did a great job of of breaking that down. So you can see that the decidua would be pulled back. So this is us looking in. So um, if you get the opportunity to have a delivery today, flip over that placenta and look at it on the maternal side, and you'll see these fat little globules on the other side. And, and you can see that with the decidua pulled back, you'll see the cotyledon. And um, I'm sure this is, I, I'm sorry, it's probably gonna be stuck in your memory um, for the rest of the day, but that single spiral artery there is responsible for perfusing that cotyledon and eventually the intervillous space at, at very high pressures. And if compromised can of course impact the developing fetus, right? We need as much of nutrient rich, oxygen rich blood to come through there. Any pathological changes at this point, right? Of the contents of the cotyledon will impact the supply chain to the fetus. So I want you to think about um, if you, uh, um, and again, I'm a geek. So uh, the most recent research on um, preeclampsia, um, they're showing that it begins, preeclampsia begins as early as when the trophoblast um, embeds in the endometrium. So if it's beginning as early as that stage of conception, you, you know that um, that if an infarct is already beginning or the narrowing of the vessels is already beginning there, that the vessels, the, the nutrient, the vessels are unable to bring nutrient rich um, blood and oxygen rich blood to the fetus in the most effective pattern. So think about that pathway is already impacted just when the trophoblast embeds. To me, that's fascinating because the microscopic changes that are occurring already set that baby up for, for IUGR, um, and they have preterm uh, delivery, um, you know, whatever those cases may be, she mama may end up, you know, quite sick because preeclampsia has already, already started. So to me, that's just fascinating. Next slide. Okay, so everybody's familiar with this slide. Um, you know, uh, to me, fetal circulation, I call it an elegant design because I think it's just fascinating that it's five unique structures that um, that we do not have as an adult. And then um, when it uh, when the baby makes that uh, transition to extra uterine life, you know, some of these structures become obsolete. I mean, just with taking the first breath, so having respiratory and the cardiovascular system um, begin on its own, so the newborn is functioning on its own, without the maternal blood um, and oxygen supply that that structures just disappear so to me this is just fascinating so so once the fetus receives that type of oxygen nutrient blood supply from the placenta so whichever it looks like whatever that placenta is coming as remember so it's either the raisin pot roast or somewhere in between um, fetal circulation is um, 
is then responsible for self distribution. So it decides where it's going to send that blood. It can take over and have preferential blood distribution. And I'm sure everybody remembers that. Um, to me, and this is how I like to remember it, um, with, you know, every, I'm sure you're watching Netflix, but think of it as the recommended for you feature on Netflix. So when I was teaching most recently, I used that analogy and, and the class thought that, you know, worked well because the fetus decides where it wants to send the blood dependent upon the stressor that's been put upon them. And remember, labor is a stressor. Uterine contractions are a stressor to that baby. So the fetal circulatory system is designed to stream blood to the most important developing structures. So it sends it to the brain, heart, and the adrenals. Those are the most important to him at that time. Remember, the lungs are only getting like 8% of the blood flow just for growth and development. The liver only gets 25% just for growth and development. Those structures are not really working within the uterine environment. So it needs to function um, and send its blood to the proper uh, structures that it wants to keep living. So, the five unique structures, I know I just alluded to them, but um, they only exist to the fetus. So the, the placenta, the umbilical cord, the ductus venosus, the formidable valley, and the ductus arteriosus. Um, so I know that um, we all think that the fetus is a miracle because otherwise, um, you know, how would they get here because of all this stuff that has to occur. So how does oxygenated blood and waste removal occur? Um, and instead of using this slide, I told you I like flow charts and I thank Lexi again for the nice org chart that's coming up next, but Lexi made us a, an org chart. And here's how I like to look at it. So when I teach the fetal monitoring classes um, for A1, I actually have a, um, a slide that I put up that is that is just this or chart that goes through how the the baby um, uh, manages the blood flow. So I know I already said this, so you know it comes in from the placenta um, through the umbilical cord. And really what this baby does is it decides, okay, well, where does it need to go? It needs to go through, um, it sends a little bit from the umbilical vein, goes to the liver, only a little bit goes there. Like I said, 25% shoots it back over to the inferior vena cava, comes up to the right atrium. Um, now it does two things here. The formino valley is, is patent, so it's open, comes over, pushes it to the left atrium, a little bit goes to the right ventricle and sends it down to the pulmonary trunk. But most importantly, when it comes over to the left atrium, you know, it goes into the left ventricle and then sends it over to the aorta because it wants it to go to, got to go to the brain, it has to go, um, it passes through the ductus arteriosus, it has to go through the systemic circulation because we need some growth and development. Um, but remember, during preferential blood distribution, it does not care about its extremities. So anybody ever seen a baby with little blue hands and feet? Yes, because guess what? That baby throughout the stages of, of um, labor, you know, either shut down or just decided preferential blood treatment was going to happen and it wasn't going to send it to those things that it didn't consider essential. So um, that's how I like to remember it. But um, you may find some other tools and, you know, that'd be great if we could see those because uh, I like to find any other way of teaching it that's easier than trying to follow the previous slide, which just looks like a maze. Okay. And so this one is called Insta Influencers. And um, so again, I try to find fun ways for us to remember like what's happening with the fetal circulation and how it manages um, the fetal heart rate events. And um, I'd like to talk about um, these instant influencers. If you follow Instagram, I'm sure you can see that um, it was copied. Thank you, Lexi, again. Um, but in Instagram, there's these things called instant in influencers, and they're social media celebrities with lots of followers and likes. And you know, they may do one thing or the other. Uh, I'm sure that you've um, seen some of those, or if you have kids, the kids definitely know. So I like to refer to the intrinsic fetal heart rate mechanisms as instant influencers. These components are responsible for the fetal heart rate's physiological response to the oxygen environment. So this is what we see on the strip, X cells, D cells, et cetera. So there's the cardioregulatory system. So that's the medulla oblongata. So that's all I need you to remember about that. Um, there's nothing else that you need to memorize, but just remember it's the medulla oblongata. It needs to be um, uh, formed properly during development. Otherwise, we're going to have some problems with um, fetal heart. And then this is also responsible for the CNS um, maturation. 
And then it breaks down to the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Again, these are probably very popular terms with your parasympathetic is pokey. It's um, moderated by the medulla oblongata. Again, that maturation part. Um, it's also responds to the vagal nerve. So 45 minute um, vag exams or, you know, um, you get in there and someone starts massaging the baby's head to put in a fetal scalp electrode. You may not have an X cell. You're probably going to have a D cell because that vagus nerve responds. It slows the fetal heart rate down. Sympathetic is the speedy part of the heart rate. It's the first to mature. You see that um, with our pre-termers. So if we've got some antepartum nurses on, you know, they're very familiar with what the sympathetic uh, nervous system is doing. It responds to release of norepinephrine and epinephrine and the catecholamines. So it's that response to stress. It speeds it up. We'll see that um, marked variability, that fight or flight. The chemoreceptors, Oh, sorry, the baroreceptors and the chemoreceptors. Baroreceptors, this is how I memorize it. Baroreceptors um, are located in the stretch, stretch receptors in the aorta, and they respond to changes in fetal blood pressure. So baroreceptors, blood pressures. That's how I like to remember it. And the chemoreceptors uh, uh, are also stretch receptors, but they're found, um, they innervate the myocardial um, uh, tissue. And so they respond to the chemicals. So a decrease in CO2, uh, sorry, increase in CO2, decrease in O2. Um, they respond to the uh, buffers being released, right? Your bicarbs. So chemoreceptors, chemicals, baroreceptors, blood pressure. And then we have acetylcholine, we have epinephrine and norepinephrine, and these are uh, released um, by the adrenals, so hormonal regulation. And they control the fight or flight and they determine the preferential blood distribution. So if the baby decides, okay, I'm just gonna slow everything down right now, and I'm gonna go into a very low variability, so you see your baseline changing, or you'll see um, variability changing, that baby's slowing things down, um, that's the baby responding uh, with hormonal regulation. So we don't have enough time really to uh, go into too much detail, um, but in our uh, strip review series, when we move forward in the new year, um, we will be taking uh, certain components and making them a theme of, of each month's presentation. So we've talked a little bit about the supply chain. We've talked about the, um, oxygen and nutrient rich blood. We've talked about internal and external influences on the fetal heart. Let's talk about oxygen. Um, so again, just a brief overview to see why it's such a critical element. Um, there's a few things that differ. I've listed content, affinity, delivery, and consumption, and then have that oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve right beside it. You know, put all the complicated things all on one slide, we'll get them out of the way. So the difference between the maternal and fetal uh, oxygen content is that the baby can survive at a very low uh, oxygen content, right? It sits at about 30 millimeters of mercury, um, whereas, you know, if we did ABGs on all of us, we're probably about 100. Um, and since we can't see that, we know that baby sits at 30, but he's got a couple of other things that are um, special to him. One, uh, the percentage of O2 that he carries on his um, hemoglobin is going to be as high as possible. And how does he make that happen? Well, he has a higher hemoglobin level, so it's, it's at about 17. Um, his affinity for hemoglobin is, is very high. So that stickiness, affinity is the stickiness, that attraction level of um, O2 to hemoglobin is higher than it would be for us. That's why his curve is a little bit higher. His delivery of O2 is dependent upon how much O2 he's getting and his cardiac output. Again, I showed you that he will manage his cardiac output based on those instant influencers. And then his consumption. Uh, he is not like the maternal patient. He's not going through actual labor, breathing with contractions or having a, his body go through a marathon the same as the maternal patient. But he has to manage his O2 consumption based on the, on the supply of O2 that he's getting. So if his supply starts to change, again, we're having contractions, maybe they're, you know, you're having tachycystole or, you know, you're having some sort of abnormal run um, of uterine activity, he has to slow his heart down because it's like, hey, I'm not getting rid of enough waste here, nor am I bringing in enough O2. I need to do something with my, my consumption. I need to slow down. Or I need to speed up, dependent upon his response with the hormonal influence. Okay. Okay, so this is a really fun slide. Um, I like to describe, um, you know, the affinity and the oxygen uh, distribution using a slide like this. So the hemoglobin's the front of the train, right? He's the engine. He gets to attract all the O2 
um, to them. So if mom comes in and she's fully saturated, she gets to carry four oxygen molecules um, throughout her body. This is assumed she's healthy, right? I got that pot roast on the right, um, and she has, you know, very minimal uh, medical history, um, and there's no medical emergency occurring. But if that happens and mom goes into a medical emergency, we will see a shift in that dissociation curve, right? It'll be left or right based on um, what she's presenting with. Um, but unfortunately, at that point, the uterus is not considered it to be um, critical despite its content. So if it's no longer essential and mom shifts on that curve, either left or right, the train here, hemoglobin, will hold on to the four carts of O2. It's not going to drop it off at the um, at the uterus for the placenta and eventually for the fetus, it's going to keep it. It becomes more stingy. And as it moves around the body, it goes, yeah, we're not giving it there. And it's going to keep it for her essential organs to make mom, um, make life-saving decisions for mom. So you won't see this being dropped off. So of course, what do we see? We see the fetal heart rate changing. We see those fetal heart rate events that are no longer ax cells. We're seeing D cells and we're seeing um, the effects of decreased oxygen to um, the utero placenta uh, environment. Okay, so a poll question. The fetus is dependent upon the maternal supply chain for oxygen and nutrient-rich blood. Okay, for the sake of time, I'm going to close this a little early. Yay, everybody passed. Okay, so, um, and I know we're running out of time here. So the cord blood gases, I love cord blood gases. I thought I'd just um, throw this in here because, you know, when you get to a case study, you like to know, okay, well, what happened? Like what, what was going on immediately before birth, right? So these are the cord blood gases. I gave you the norms. Um, these are important. Um, it's a, a, a direct measurement. It's objective data, right? So it removes any subjectivity. And this is the status of the baby right before delivery, right? Not of the baby, because we didn't take it from the baby. That's the NICU to do if that baby goes off that direction. But this is right before, so we can tell what that intrauterine environment really looked like, um, what, what the status was. Um, very important to sample both. Venus will always be higher because it is bringing in the oxygen-rich blood. So it's gonna tell me how the placenta was oxygenating that environment. It does not tell me how baby was doing. The artery, the umbilical artery is going to tell me how well baby was uh, doing. So how well he was able to remove his waste and what environment he looked, would look like for him. So um, I, I'm, I'm a real weirdo. You can imagine me in a delivery room saying, uh, want cord blood gases? Please have cord blood gases. And then, um, you know, taking both because uh, I'd like to see what was going on. So we're gonna do a um, quick little review on the next slide. You can put this in, actually, if you just wanna, yeah, let's just skip over to the poll because we don't have time. Um, so first poll question, what are the cord blood gas results of the woo, following? Arterial cord blood sample, pH is 7.12, uh, PCO2 uh, is 46, P, the PO2 is 18, and base depth is 7.8. Remember you have, oh, you may not be able to see the norms. So pH normal would be greater than or equal to 7.1. Okay. Lexi? Sorry, I was checking on mute, I think. Make sure the right poll question is launched. There are about half and share the results. Okay, so this is a normal um, cord blood gas. Uh, first thing you want to look at is the pH. So it's greater than um, 7.10. I'm using ACOGs um, and AAPs uh, guidelines. So your values may differ a little bit based on your hospital. So don't freak out if you're like, well, our normal is 7.2, which it may be. Um, I use ACOG and AAPs and it, um, it is greater than or equal to 7.1. Next one. Okay. 
So core blood gas results of the following arterial core blood sample, again, back to the norms that I provided. So greater than or equal to 7.10. So here it's um, the pH is 6.75. So we know something's on board. We know acidemia is present. The PCO2, um, if it's greater than uh, 60, so we know it's abnormal and it's at 89. We have PO2, which is four. Uh, our norm would be uh, greater than 20. So we know that's abnormal. And our base deficit here is 18.6. Our norm should be less than or equal to 12. So if pH is abnormal, PCO2 is abnormal, PO2 is abnormal, and our base deficit is abnormal, knowing that the buffers were being released, et cetera. So this baby was working in a lactic acid environment. It's a mixed acidemia, good. Now, are you wrong if you say metabolic acidemia? No, because at that point, it doesn't matter, right? If the baby is functioning in a lactic acid environment and has a pH of 6.75 and a base deficit at 18.6, does it really matter what's going on? Otherwhere, no, because you're going to treat the metabolic acidemia that's on board, right? You're going to get rid of that lactic acid. Okay, so um, this is policy basics. I'm just going to skip over that because uh, for sake of time, we need to get to some strips. This is doc talk. This is how I like to call um, our delivering clinicians. This is the order in which I like to give the SBAR. Um, this is how I like to assess the strip. Uh, I think it's really important that you give them the same report every single time and then they can memorize your pattern versus um, your, your terminology that um, you may use in your hospital. I gave you the terminology just so that you had a chart available to you. The category two algorithm, um, certainly uh, if you aren't familiar with it, I'm, I'm sure that you will be familiar with it. This was produced by um, Clark et al. in 2013. Uh, reason why I put it here is we do have this as, available as a batch buddy um, on our website. If you uh, would like to have access to it, it's just on our uh, website and I'll have Lexi drop that for you in the chat box when we're done. And this is part of our handout. I just talk about the big five. It's how I um, uh, discuss our intervention. So certainly we look at if something's going on with our patient and we're trying to address any interruption to the oxygen uh, pathway, you know, we really only have um, the five categories that we can manage, right? We look at their fluid, we manage their uterine activity, we go to supplemental oxygen. And one of our perigen, um strip series is going to involve talking about supplemental oxygen to the maternal patient, the efficacy and, and the norms now. Um, we have to do some sort of maternal position change. I mean, you have to alleviate pressure on the cord if that's um, the situation. And then of course, communication, using the doc talk, calling your uh, charge nurses or delivering clinicians to attend. Okay, let's get into the cases. So for everyone that's not familiar with um, Perigen, I am giving you a 30 minute compressed view of the strip. Um, that is how our system um, uh, vigilance works. And so I wanted you to see the 30 minute versus our 15. So I could give you more of the strip because we're always asking for more of the strip. Emmy's a 30 year old uh, G1P0 at 36 and 47. She's a negative prenatal history and a negative medical history. She complains of decreased fetal movement Thinks maybe her bag of water broke approximately five hours ago. Vital signs are 160 over 90. Pulse is 98. Her temp is 101.1. Respiratory rate is 22. She's group rate is negative. Her VAG exam is negative three, 50% minus two. Uh, we are determining whether she's uh, ruptured. And this is her admission tracing. Sorry, I need to take a drink of water. So hopefully that's um, coming up. You can see on our strip here, our, uh, our um, system is trying to calculate what it is seeing based on the uterine contraction pattern that's occurring on the bottom. Oh, sorry, I'm having a bit of a, <clears throat> my throat is drying up for some reason. Okay. So um, obviously the uterine contractions were going to palpate and readjust. Her heart rate is sitting about the 160 uh, mark. She's having what look like uh, variables in a late at right at the end. And um, still has moderate variability, but we want to uh, make sure that we are tracking those contractions appropriately. 
So we're going to make some adjustments and see if those uh, um, <clears throat> events being marked above are actually occurring with our contractions. So if we go to the next slide. 15 minutes later, she's positive for ruptured membranes, fluid is clear, no bright red bleeding noted, and normal bloody show is present, present and no odor noted. So what, are the what is the physiological cause of the fetal heart rate seen here? <clears throat> you can put them in the chat box or the Q question box or wherever you are. Again, trying to make this <clears throat> interactive. And while you're doing that, <clears throat> KK, let me know when the stuff comes in. Heart rate is hovering between 155 and one, looks like it's 150 and 155. She is having, you can see the strip. It is barking them as late decelerations. So I've got a lot coming in. I've got uh, tacky baby, utero placental insufficiency, position change, Utero placental insufficiency coming up a lot. Lates, lates, lack of perfusion. She's got a raisin, Alana. That's one of my answers. She's got a raisin. Oh, I love you. Uh -huh. Yay. <laughs> we have a raisin, right? So, so yes, those are lates. And again, I would, you know, still want to get my hands on that belly. I have no documentation on whether those contractions are, are, you know, what the strength of those contractions are. It's an external monitor. So, uh, you know, a uh, typical labor nurse, I'm like, ooh, I want more info. So it looks like the contractions are occurring, you know, some eight, four to eight minutes apart. <clears throat> and again, wanting uh, more information because there isn't anything documented. I met orders um, for labor and continuous feed and monitoring and orders to call physician if pattern does not improve within the hour. So again, trying to follow the Clark, um, um, uh, category two. And then on the next tracing. <clears throat> so the patient complaints of pain, uh, seven out of 10 with contractions, She's requesting epidural for pain management. <clears throat> patient uh, continues to have lates and variables. Contractions again are, um, at least they're coming up now, we can see them. Um, so they're between three and six minutes apart, at least to buy this strip, but that doesn't mean anything, right? We all know that they could be hiding. Uh, it does give me the weight of the patient. So if she's fluffy and we can't get a good external monitor, maybe consider using internals at this point. Uh, contractions need to be palpated, telco readjusted to ensure accuracy of urine contraction monitoring. RN continues to monitor patient and does not call the physician with an update. So, um, you know, obviously that's a red flag. We're continuing to have uh, signs of decompensation. And the RN also has another patient and is busy going between two rooms. Next slide. So four hours after the patient first arrived to the unit, the strip is not improving. And in fact, um, is now worse than when she first arrived. You can see that we're losing variability. The RN assigned to the patient has not noticed that the uterine contractions have not been captured for over an hour due to prioritizing patient care for the other patient. Emmy's physician calls for an update in the primary RN states, no contractions for the last hour and variables are present. Unfortunately, this was not a complete report and does not cover all the essential details necessary to convey the patient's current situation, clinical characteristics of the strip and fetal decompensation. Um, important to ensuring a safe delivery, what concerns do you have about this maternal fetal diet? You can type those in the chat. KK, let me know what comes up for whatever reason I cannot see. Yep, it's coming in now. Minimal variability now. Raising baseline, decreased variability with D cells. Infant tacky, does mom have a temp question mark? Need to treat the temp. Fetal intolerance, tachycardia, mental variability. What have, we, what have we done for her? Fluids, oxygen, position change, question mark. Tachycardia with decreased variability. Bolus, question mark, position change, question mark. Baby is saying, make me a newborn. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's, her, what's her cervical exam? Can fetus tolerate this much longer, question mark. 
every what's the exam what's the exam um and maybe perhaps we should get a better contraction tracing good one Amen. Mm -hmm. sepsis question mark scve please <laughs> Back so this is continued for four more hours. The patient made progressive cervical changes and the fetus status did not improve. Proper uterine contraction monitoring was in place for the remainder of the patient's labor and UCs were documented at every two to two and a half minutes strong bipalpation with soft resting tone in between. The patient experienced a vacuum delivery at 09-16. The male infant, Afgar is eight and nine. Cord blood gases are drawn routine for all vacuum assisted deliveries. Arterial, are, bleh, Arterial sample results, 6.99 PCO2 is 80, PO2 is 20, base deficit is 8. All right, I know we are at time, but um, do you want to move to case two and then I'll let everybody go? Okay, so I'll do case two and then we'll save the other two for January. Jessica has a 39-year-old G4P3 at 40 and 4. Medical history is negative. Prenatal history is positive for gestational diabetes. <clears throat> Prenatal labs are negative. Arrives at triage for induction of labor orders direct from physician's office. Vital signs are 120 over 80. Uh, pulse 80, respiratory rate 18, and temp is 98.7. Current pain is 4 out of 10. Fetal heart rate assessment right now is a category 1 tracing. So what are we already thinking about? I, I text in the I guess the question box, um, anything that we're worried about based on her, her history. Advanced maternal age, tachycystole, neonatal hypoglycemia, large baby, baby looks good, good variability, worry about GDM, IgA, gestational diabetes and age, size of the baby, current blood sugar, advanced maternal age, blood sugar. Exactly. So um, so she's a raisin. That's what I'm thinking right now. And I'm preparing for everything, right? I'm emergent delivery, big baby, shoulder dystocia, all those um, lovely parting gifts that moms like this get um, with, with diabetes on board. So 30 minutes later, sorry, next slide. Next. The patient is very concerned that the baby is going to be big this time due to gestational diabetes. She's worried about a vag delivery. Her vag exam is 250 and minus one. She's cephalic, intact bag of water. <clears throat> so what do you think happened right in the middle of this strip here? Any guesses? Because we can see by the event markers that uh, vigilance is calling out, oh, we were having axels with moderate variability, and then we started having variable, variable, don't know because we had lost the signal, variable, variable, variable. <laughs> now it's a late. <clears throat> yep, so I'm getting ROM, 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 SROM, water broke. Um, is she maybe abrupting? Do we have a cord? Cord? Question mark? Water broke? Still technically. I love it. You're my peeps. Yes, physician came in, a -rom. Clearly the fetus did not appreciate that invasion of privacy and responded with all these lovely variables caused by that vagus nerve. Remember the medulla oblongata is completely intact, right? We had CNS maturation. He went in, fished around, and this is what the result was. I'm sure I'm not um, the only one that just rolled their eyes when this happened and went, geez, thanks a lot. My baby was happy. <laughs> all right, next uh, slide. Two hours after, um, two hours later, this uh, the fetus does recover. Um, so um, now I'm thinking, well, maybe I do have a pot roast in place, and this baby is going to tolerate um, labor today. Contractions are two to three minutes apart. They're strong by palpation, soft resting tone in between. Patient complaints of um, pressure, so a sterile vag exam is performed by the RN. Is she six 100 minus one? Patient requests an epidural for pain rated on eight, uh, rated an eight. And so preload would start at patient position for the epidural. Next slide. So here we are. Uh, the 20 minutes after the epidural is placed, uh, the patient um, actually uh, went to complete and she started pushing. Fetal heart rate is category two and appears not to be tolerating pushing with every contractions. UCs are uh, two minutes apart. 
What should we do to assist with fetal tolerance of second stage? Push every other contraction, position changes, every other or every third. It's that's like eight million times that's coming through because these are your peeps. They know what to do. Yeah. Yep. Every other contraction in in different positions, push in different positions. Perfect. So, I mean, lovely. She's a multi, so we're hoping this is going to be quick anyway. Doctors at bedside, outcomes patient pushed for an additional 15 minutes. Strip did not improve. Patient delivered a baby girl at 1107 who was 810. Apgars were 9 and 9. No cord blood gases were obtained. All right, so um, I did have two other strips for us to review. We will save those for January for the, our brand new. That's a nice little segue into this. Um, is our new strip review series. So we're going to offer a monthly fetal strip review meeting um, that will be highly participative. So this won't be just you talking in the chat box. This is going to be us looking like we're on, um, uh, like, uh, so that we're all seeing each other and can talk about what we're seeing on the strip um, and really uh, make this far more interactive. We're really excited about this. Um, we have lots of uh, yucky strips to appease everybody's um, tastes. And, um, um, you'll see an invitation for that coming up next. You're going to see an option if you'd like to opt in for an invitation. That's this one here. So. Okay, you should have a poll up if you're interested in being invited to that. Please respond yes to the poll. So if you respond that you'd be interested in receiving an invitation, this does not hold you to attending, but if you want to receive an invitation because our capacity is limited um, to make this interactive, um, you will receive a, uh, an invite in the email. Yeah. Awesome. I'll give everyone another second. And we're running over. Awesome. So it looks like everyone's Yes, or maybe so. Awesome. Excellent, excellent. Um, I love reviewing strips, um, so we're looking forward to that. KK? Well, thanks everybody for joining us today for this uh, informative webinar. And thanks again to Alana for sharing her time and talent to deliver this great offering I'm seeing in the you know, the questions, everybody's really loved this event and really excited about the strip review. So that's fantastic. I'm Karen Kalega, I'm Perry Gents Clinical Engagement Executive. I just wanna take a minute to discuss our Perry Watch Vigilance product. It's an OB early warning system um, and it's an automated early warning system for mom and baby that supports your care of that invisible patient. It works with the existing systems you have in place, so there is no need to rip and replace what you have. It aggregates data from your fetal monitor and your medical record, analyzes it, gives it back to you with actual not actionable notifications and information. It's a quality improvement tool, so it doesn't send information back to the permanent medical record. And the goal is to Provide caregivers with timely notifications of potentially worsening conditions so you can assess the invisible patient, intervene as appropriate, and potentially avoid a, de a delay in care. Next slide, please. If you'd like to know more about the PeriWatch Vigilance System, I'll place a link in the chat box so you could register for Coffee with KK. Coffee with KK is another fun event we came up with. 15 minutes of your time, that's it. I'll give you a quick overview of the system. So you can decide whether or not that might be a good fit for your care team. And we'll send you that Starbucks gift card so you can enjoy your coffee with me. Thanks again for joining us today. Uh, love this event and everybody have a really wonderful holiday. I have a quick summary. I know you're going to receive these slides, but please reach out if you have any questions or concerns because they did you know, go quickly from cord blood gas on. Um, you know, certainly we reviewed that oxygen physiological pathways is, is critical to fetal health. Um, I hope you remember the raisin and the pot roast if you take anything away from this conversation. Um, you know, just tell me, you know, tell me what you got when your patient came through the door. They are raisin, pot roast. Um, 
I really think it's important that we have a comprehension of the fetal circulation. I think it's an essential skill for all uh, labor and delivery nurses to understand what's happening there and, and, and really understand those five unique structures. Category two fetal strips are 85% of what we see. Um, we will do more of those as the new year progresses. Uh, I'm looking forward to digging deep and, and showing you some really fun strips that we have in our system. And then um, obviously, thank you for all that you do and, and for giving good care. Hey, and just to close us out, um, we did put together a fetal monitoring quick reference guide, um, which is a few of the things that Dr. Alana McGarrick talked about today. So um, that should be in your handout section. We'll also send that to you after. Um, and just closing us out, a survey will appear when you close the panel as well as a follow-up email. We really appreciate your feedback. Um, thank you for all that you do and we wish you a very happy holiday season. So thank you for joining us.